Oi. So, Raul, it's great to see you again. It's great to see you. Well, here in New York, yeah. Yeah. wonderful the, new offices. In the new studio. Absolutely. It's great. So, really looking forward to talking about a few things that we've talked about in the past and some yeah. things maybe we haven't. So There's a lot going on, I think. There is a lot going on in the world. There is a lot going on. So, I'd like to start with that, actually. Where do you think we are in terms of markets, in terms of, you know, just the general place where uh, we find ourselves? I've spent some time thinking about this and a lot of it a lot of my framework of thinking actually came from your piece of world on the brink when I try and understand it in the really big context not just the, the minutiae of what the market's doing today or where the world is today or the trade negotiations but the, in the big picture I just see that things are changing and people need an understanding of things like what the rules-based global order system is and what it means, which I was really introduced, you, introduced to from you. And that piece, I didn't really understand the framework of how much of the world we understand today operates because it wasn't that relevant to me because it worked. So I never tested it, never thought about it. But now we're seeing some changes that are really big. Now, does it mean that we are going beyond what we know into a whole new system? You know, when, we, when I read The Fourth Turning by Neil Howe, which I think I've talked to you about before, is it, would, it was very suggestive that generationally these kind of cycles happened and the world obviously contracts and expands in its economic and political thought process. And for me, it feels like this is the time, that it feels like things are getting more extreme, whether it's economic policy or, or the political situation and the world political situation is getting more extreme, more polarized that usually when you get one extreme, you either get the opposite extreme, and eventually, as the system comes near to breaking, you find some sort of middle ground. Right. And I just feel like we're somewhere in that. Yeah. We, th that Hegelian synthesis, uh, you know, thesis, antithesis, synthesis, seems to not be working right now. And it seems like we're um, at, at a point at which we have not been for a long time as a civilization. But it seems to me that there are different things going on. The role of technology which is at a level and in a direction nobody ever anticipated, the size of the population, which is, you know, has in my lifetime tripled. I mean, it's astonishing, you know, what, what has, and, and the role that those things have played in increasing the divisiveness of the world. And so you see this splintering effect, for example, that I think is, is manifest in all sorts of areas that nobody anticipated, really. Yeah, and the other thing I think is the, is the demographic, the aging population of the West, and now increasingly China, is something that we don't know how to deal with, because people have entirely different perceptions when they're retired, for example, than when they're 30. When you have this many people going through changes, they become risk averse, or they want to look back in the past that's a particular focus I know you've looked at, yeah. is that kind of focus of what was steady and good in the past or perceived to be steady and good in the past. Right. Is that applicable in the kind of world that we're talking about where technology is fracturing and changing society so dramatically that people don't really have an understanding of what even's going on? Yeah, well, as you know, I would argue that it isn't. It's the politics of nostalgia, and it's this desire to return to what was seen to be a simpler time. But, you know, in, in thinking about that, as, as, you know, having finished World on the Brink and, and, and just seeing the world change, it really, when you stop and think about the 60s or 70s, you know, it was a time in which we were faced with nuclear annihilation with, between the U.S. and the Soviet Union. I mean, they were putting, hiding kids under their desks and doing drills that, of course, wouldn't have protected anybody from anything. So it was really wasn't a golden age, but we see it as that. And if I look back on film clips, or even where I remember growing up in the late 70s, it was, in England, it was minor strikes, it was misery, it was inflation, it was no jobs. If I listen to the music of the time, it's all about how disgruntled and miserable people were. Yeah. So to look back on that and say, those were the great periods. I mean, in Britain, for example, and again, I don't want to make this political, but more observational, is looking back and saying they were the great times before the European Union, I don't see that. And again, I'm not passing judgment on the European Union because I don't want to get the comment section filled with politics. I just want people to observe what's going on. Yeah, I think you're exactly right. And I also think that there's a, an effect here of, um, of simply not being able to put yourself in the shoes that you were in in the past. And you know, I, a friend of mine told me that someone in England had mentioned to him that 
uh, in, in discussing Brexit, had said this remark, which I thought was very pithy and, and expressed a lot of the uh, attitudes of a, of a large part of the British population. They said, we would be happy to be measurably less wealthy, to be measurably more British. And that, I thought, was a very telling remark. Have you run across similar things in? I, you know, I think there are different narratives from different people because society is fracturing, and not just in the UK, whether it's Catalonia or whether it's in the US or all over the world where we're seeing this, we're seeing a little bit of, the, well, significant amounts of this in Italy, um, I think we'll see it on the rise in Germany. Different levels and, uh, of dissatisfaction, discontent, coming from different narratives are all rolling into one. It's people don't know who to blame for the situation we're in. And I think we should talk a little bit about some of the, the triggers that, that got us here. So therefore, these narratives get rolled into one, so Brexit becomes it, or Trump or anti-Trump comes the other, when really that's not the issue. That's just the superficial level of what caused these issues in the first place. You know, Why did wage growth, real wage growth, remain stagnant or shrink since the 70s? Yeah. You know, th those are the questions. You know? How much is globalization it's very fashionable to think of globalization as the, the great opportunity for everybody, but it wasn't. It was a really mixed thing. And one of the things that I really have had a profound impact on me was seeing James Goldsmith's interview with um, Charlie Rose. This was back in 1996, <coughs> after NAFTA was first put in place, and they were negotiating the WTO. And James Goldsmith was a pure capitalist. Right? He's not a European socialist of the old model, right. but he was half French, half English. And he sat there and argued with everybody, every way he could to say, what you're about to do is wrong because you are going to give the full competitive advantage to those with the cheapest labor force. So you're just gonna create labor force arbitrage. And clearly in countries with an expensive labor force, you're gonna to to destroy the labor force and their wages. And that will create social unrest, it'll create populism, and it'll create all the things that we've got to. It's so prophetic. Yeah. His answer was, and I think rightly so, was have globalization but on equal terms. So his terms were, if you want to compete in China's market, have a factory in China, hire Chinese weight, labor force, and sell to China. If the Chinese want to be in the US, do it that way. So you're on an equal footing. So he kind of believed in some sort of tariff system. Um, and I had not come across that because everybody before was so free market, capitalist. No. I thought, you know, maybe he's right. So I understand why the Trump tariffs also appeal to people. But also, he was dead right in what the outcome would be. This is um, Goldsmith, would be this huge disparity. And in the end, it questions what the role of government is. Is it, it for the people or for GDP growth? Well, and this, is, this gets into a whole complex of issues. And I think, you know, one of the things people are now starting to talk about is hyper-globalization. It's a term that's now being, you know, you're starting to see it. And the, and the context that that's usually given in is the, the idea that globalization became a good in and of itself, became seen to be a good in and of itself. And this process was encouraged simply for its own, of its own accord, of, of its own merit, yeah. without looking at what the actual outcomes of it were. And it became a kind of a, a you know, a thought camp, a, a kind of, you know, a group think. Yeah, and as all Unquestioned, yeah. you know. And that led to a point at which, you know, the benefits became dramatic. Maybe the benefits were, you know, it, it is a benefit to be able to buy a $300 flat screen TV. No question. Yeah. And, and that is a result of globalization. Yeah. And, of, 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 you know, it's, it's the kind of idea of the things produced at the cheapest possible price benefit everyone. And that, that sort of idea. But the... Um, Tip, the, 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 the tipping point came, I would argue, and I, I know some of the people in the world on the brink argue this too, um, when the uh, financial cra crash of, the, of 2008, 2009 happened, and suddenly it, the tables turned for so many people where there might have been some marginal um, advantage to what they were seeing from globalism, even, if, even though their w wages were actually suppressed or certainly had not advanced in real terms, but they were able to buy certain things and that, that was a compensation. And then suddenly the bottom fell out of it. So, you know, you had some very interesting observations the last time we talked about how we got to where we are and the role of debt and its origins. And I would love to hear you talk about that again. 
Yeah, my view on this is that <coughs> is to get to where we are today, we need to understand where we came from. And my view on this was, it's all about the baby boomers. And it's always the law of unintended consequences. Nobody really realizes what's happening until way too late. And in these kind of things, these big political economic things, they take a long time before you realize the mess you got yourself into. So if you think of the baby boomers, their parents were austere. They'd lived through two world wars. They didn't spend money, high savings rates. Nothing was frivolous. Everything had a function and a form. So then this massive population of young people rebelled against that system, as everybody does. So what they wanted was they wanted to do the opposite of their parents. Most of us do that. So a couple of things happened. One was Wall Street picked up on it really quickly, as Wall Street is quick to figure out how to make a buck out of people's change in sentiment. And the quick thing that they decided was that, why should you save like your parents saved? 20%, 30% of your income saving. We don't need to do that because some smart guy on Wall Street can take 5% of your income and magically turn it into your retirement fortune. So you don't have to do that. So you can go and spend more money. There was another sub-narrative, which was the post-World War II narrative across the world, which was spend, particularly prevalent in America. Consumption was the savior of the US economy. So that was ingrained in these young kids' heads. Consume, consume. Wall Street says, well, we can allow you to consume. So up starts the pension system and the financialization of the economy. So that is a slow process because all of these baby boomers are young. So they're not saving any money, much like the millennials now. But as they started hitting their 30s, that money started to really accumulate because it was a proportion of their income. And the incomes are rising because they were going into, the, into jobs and the economy was strong, etc. Then the second thing happened. So we're now into... We're about 1980, 1982. And Margaret Thatcher did something that I don't think most people realized changed everything, is she realized to bring the working classes into the labor force, the best thing to do was let them invest in the economy by having a house, which was a stroke of political genius and turned tons of working classes into middle classes by being property owners. And that was the council houses in England. So they were government owned housing projects, or, uh, and they basically sold them off for nothing, basically giving free money, much like the Russians did with the, with the mining properties and stuff like that. So it politicized a whole bunch of people who became conservative voters, which gave the whole strength of the Conservative Party through the entire 80s and into the 90s. But what it did is turn people with no debt, literally no debt, into massive debtors overnight and taught them that debt was good. Borrow money, you'll get rich. At the same time, they liberalized credit cards and, and, um, and other forms of borrowing for consumers. So therefore, you didn't have to save any money to buy anything. The pension was taken care of by the smart guy on Wall Street, and Wall Street had basically financialized your credit. So you now had a mortgage, and now you had credit card debt, and now you had higher purchase. Then you were buying cars on lease. That was the big move. And this spread to the US very quickly. Reagan had seen what had happened and realized that it would incentivize Americans too. So this whole thing was great. It created an enormous boom in the 80s. But what happened was the debt boom became huge because people borrowed more and more and more to drive that consumption that was now ingrained within them. And then the governments were doing the same, and the private sector was doing the same, and everybody, because interest rates were falling, often due to um, demographics. And so this whole thing created this enormous debt bubble. But the other thing that really interests me, I mean, a lot of people talk about the debt bubble, but what really interested me is what they did, which is, I think, the seed of the whole problem, is there used to be a division between capital and labor. If you had the capital, i.e. you had money, you could risk it because you understood the risk, it was your capital to risk. If you were labor, you earned your income to then eventually retire and leave the labor pool. And what happened is they made labor capital mm -hmm. because you took savings from people that ordinarily would have been in cash and leveraged them. The system leveraged all of this money so, they, so people were then taking undue massive risk huge stock market risk, and massive debt risk. And they didn't really realize they were doing it. 
they didn't realize that they had become the leverage or they had become the um, collateral for the global financial yeah. system. Because if we think of the world that we live in now of hedge funds and private equity and venture capital and all of this stuff, it's all leverage capital based off the savings of retirement money. There's very little other money out there. That's right. Uh, there's central bank leverage money, but that's just leveraging this collateral of the system. Which is why pension plans are among the world's largest investors. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. And so if that's the collateral, you've turned these people, they're, they're now risk takers and they don't know it. So 2000 came along and they kind of got away with it. Many people lost quite a lot of money. But when the collateral part of the system started to break down in 2008, and their houses collapsed, which was, which was their collateral, which was then collateral within the financial system, and that leverage built upon leverage, everyone was like, I didn't know I was doing this. And that was because they basically got taken advantage of. This is why the financial system is so outsized versus any other time in history, because we turned labor into capital, and they didn't know the risk they were taking. So how do you unwind that system? Well, what you've got is now this disgruntlement is I've lost money, my real wages have gone down, globalization didn't quite work in the same way that I thought. Also, you've got this bifurcated inflation rates where anything globalized is ultra cheap and anything non-globalized like healthcare, pharmaceuticals, um, education is ultra expensive. So they've got themselves into a really difficult situation of which they're angry. The retirees, the baby boomers are now angry because they can't retire. The young people are angry because they have no opportunities, not as many opportunities, and they're now having to do things like borrow money to get an education. That didn't used to, be, that didn't used to occur. So we've now got those two bifurcated parts, and then we've got this, the middle of the destruction of industries that were never replaced by capital-intensive industries, the shift to the global services economy. All this has happened at the same time. And then, as you rightly say, you throw in technology and the outcomes become kind of warp speed in how fast they come. And the inability to people with de to deal with that is huge. Yeah, and, and the debt bubble is bigger now than it was in 2008. That's right. By and quite a large margin. Yeah, and it's shifted around. And now the emerging markets are part of the debt bubble. So they've got $15 trillion that they've borrowed of dollars. So this whole leverage upon leverage upon leverage is still there. But my fear is that we are getting to many tipping points and that these are not quick things that happen overnight. But those baby boomers are leaving the labor force and they're retiring. And knowing, as I mentioned Real Vision several times, when my father retired, what did he do? His spending went straight down, fell probably 60% in the first year, yeah. and it's probably 80% less uh, until he recently became ill, 80% less than where it was at peak. So that's so deflationary. Um, but also, what did he do? He sells off you know, his pension, he switched to fixed income. So he's selling off equities. Right. But start thinking about downsizing houses, you know, buy a new car and those things. But if those people, which are basically the collateral of the financial system, most of it's owned by these baby boomers, if they start divesting the collateral of the system, the whole leverage has to shrink. And, and they will because they simply don't have enough money because they didn't save 30% of their What are their they going to do, income. die with a basket of equities? Yeah, exactly. No, the idea is that it was there to save them. Now, the problem is, is we go back to the original story, that smart guy on Wall Street never made them the money they were supposed to make. That's right. So they haven't got the money they thought they had, and they would have been much better to invest 20% of their savings and put it in the bank. Yeah. But Wall Street lied to them. Yeah. Well, you know, um, one of the things that I think gets lost in this whole argument is, is a visceral understanding of what debt is. Because debt is borrowing from the future to pay for the present. And it only works if the future is always wealthier than the present. And I think we have lost We've lost sight of that. Yeah. yeah, although there is some complication, I'm not clear in my mind, whether government debt falls into that category. We thought it did. We think of it like a household balance sheet, but maybe it's not. Well, that's true. And, and this is one of the great fallacies is that it, people say, you know, it's, it's easy to, to run a government. You just run it like a household. But households and governments are entirely different. For one thing, most households don't print money. <laughs> yeah. but, but, but nevertheless, I think that and we don't really understand what government debt is. And some people claim we don't understand what money is, as you know. Um, but, but there certainly is a, uh, a, a, an underlying presumption about debt that it's, it is based on a, a rosier future than the present. 
Well, student debt is the clearest example. Exactly. Yeah. Right, that you're going to get a payoff from what you, from the money you've borrowed that bought you an education that's going to give you a return on your capital or on the debt. But maybe that's the fallacy like the house, the debt on mortgages was, or the fallacy like the equity market was. And it seems to be playing out that, that if, there's an, if there's too much desire for debt to buy something with, usually the thing you're buying is worthless. Yeah, yeah. You know, exactly. it happens all, it's excess leverage and excess speculation or excess desire for something. Right. And it feels like an education is almost becoming worthless, particularly, in, and we'll talk about this when we go forward, is what education do you need now? What is actually applicable to the world we're moving into? It's not clear. It's not. And it, and it, but, but it is clear that certain jobs, some of which are very highly paid, many of which are not, are much more subject to replacement by automation than others and you know the ones that are creative and I'm, I mean it's I'm becoming I thought that and I thought that all creative arts were not going to be replaced but I'm even seeing music made by algorithm yeah. and I'm seeing yes okay it doesn't fall into the, the the realms of genius and the greatness that great artists do but for the majority of the population a lot of music is now basically an algorithm yeah. so I'm now thinking okay well maybe Painting can be as well, maybe all forms of artwork, and that makes me really miserable about, okay, well, who does have, who does have a role for the future? Yeah. And maybe the answer for that is, and I think we've talked about this before, is birth rate collapse. Yeah. And we think birth rates are low now, but maybe they're gonna get down to a half. Yeah. You know, because in many nations, they're 1.3 1. 1. in some parts of Europe per family, so they're not replacing, they're, they're shrinking dramatically, but maybe they'll fall even further because there is no actual need for as many people. Yeah. Th that won't happen in other parts of the world very quickly, though. No, that's and right. And that creates another kind of... <laughs> that's <laughs> another huge <laughs> imbalance that's happening. You know, there's another discontinuity with this that I think is just becoming apparent, and that is that there, you know, robots and, and automation, let's say generally artificial intelligence, automation, the world of robots, all those things together as they replace jobs. Robots don't buy things. So the whole cycle, the consumer cycle is broken. And I, this is something that is just beginning to become clear. And really, we don't know what the implications of it are because it, it normally, you know, you, somebody has a job, you pay them, they go out and they spend money and, they, and they, that creates the, the economic cycle. But, but a, a, a robot doesn't. But because therefore productivity has no benefit to the economy except to the owners of businesses exactly. who get the excess profits, if there are any. Yeah. Because with robots, you can compete with all the profits as globalization did. So it's not clear that it does that. You're dead right. I mean, where does the money come from? What is, a con what is society if it's not a consumer-based society? Yeah. Okay, that's what we understand now. Not all societies have been consumer-based societies. That's true. Maybe economic, maybe personal well-being is how the society becomes over due course. Maybe it's not. Maybe it's some sort of self-interest with a different rewards-based system. I don't know. You know, this also gets into the issue of equality because I, there's, a, there's another interesting argument that technology actually um, accentuates inequality because technology requires investment. Investment requires wealth. So the people who invest have a disproportionate advantage, as you just mentioned, of the, of the fruits of technology. The, the people with less wealth have maybe a secondary advantage. But So it, it actually increases the divergence. It increases the so inequality. There's a classic version of this that I don't think most people are aware of, but they need to be aware of. So there's <coughs> firms out there, and I won't name names, there's a bunch of algorithmic-based AI investment firms. So there is a world of what these guys are doing, and there's a world of how traditional investors. So there's a traditional portfolio manager in Ohio looking after a state pension fund, investing in the hotel sector. He gets his research from Morgan Stanley, he goes on the conference calls, he listens to the management, right. he maybe looks at his charts, and he forms his investment view and he makes buy and sell decisions. Right. Who he's competing against is now not the other fund manager in Florida State Pension Plan or wherever it is. It's in fact with one of these firms that pings, they have such huge computing power, they're pinging every single hotel booking website in the world millions of times a day because they know there's an algorithm within all of those booking sites that, rises, that increases the price and lowers the price according to demand. They ping it for prices and what it's telling them is how what the occupancy 
is like every hotel they want to check in any city, anywhere in the world, in any economy, in real time. So they know, of course, what the results are going to be. They know at any one day how well the hotel sector is doing. So what chance is the poor guy who's been doing the work the work the world used to be, applying his brain, applying his blood, sweat, and tears into his portfolio, what chances does he have? Yeah. So what happens is the excess profits go to the other guy, which is what you're talking about. Exactly. That the automation is creating excess profits or supernormal profits elsewhere. Now, can those supernormal profits get competed away? Well, we've seen that in the high-frequency trading industry where there were supernormal profits and then so many entrants that profits collapsed. So, and that can be algorithmically driven as well. That's of course, way. of course. Yeah. Once the technology is there, the barriers to entry actually collapse quite quickly. Yeah. So I don't know what that means either into the overall thing. There's a lot of questions here, no answers, but you know. Well, I think that you know you ha- we've got to come. We've got to peel the onion on the questions before we can even start to. Come yeah, up with I totally answers. agree. Um, but you know, one of the things that that I think is is. Um, is very evident, and, and you mentioned financialization, which I think is a huge issue. But the, the tie of that to short-termism and the whole way we think about the world now in terms of very short-term returns and very short-term gratification and so forth, and it again, ties back to what you know, our ancestors who had gone through not only two world wars but a depression thought about, and they thought of much longer terms. Yeah. And that itself has a, has a psychological effect on, on uh, and I think you're seeing it not only with the older generation, but I think you're seeing it with the younger generation that you know they're interested in in right now. I mean, uh, and there is something to be said for treasure the present present moment and yeah. you know focus on carpe diem and all that. But nevertheless, when your when your focus is entirely uh, on the short term, perhaps because you don't even believe you have any idea what the long term or is it a behavioral aspect of we are now conditioned for a gratification-based economy. Exactly. Yeah. You know, and we'll come on to behavioral economics later because yeah. I think this plays a big role yeah. in where all this is going and some of the real complications of the world. But maybe we're now conditioned to an environment where we want it and we want it now just because that's where the world's gone. So we've become much more short-term in nature. Now, normally, for me, if I see that, I know that the outsized returns or the great opportunities lie in different time horizons. <coughs> You know, and wind forward the political clock 20 years, let's say. Maybe, maybe to stop this ridiculous cycle that goes with politics, that people have a 12-year term or a 10-year term. Yeah. Um, And so your vote counts. So you really make a difference, and then you get the government in, as long as they don't do anything illegal. The government is in and stays in, and we don't have those midterm cycles of, as we've just gone through, a fiscal boost to goose the economy, then it slips off again, then you have to have another goose to get into the election, yeah. get real. You know, this is no way to run an economy, particularly not an economy the size of the US, where it's ultra prevalent in, in that. And the, all of those things, I think the opportunity, if we're looking for answers, the answers will lie in the opposite of short term. The opposite of things that are there now are probably where the answer lies, because as we talked about in the beginning, there's only a number of outcomes and usually the polar opposites somewhere it's either the opposite of what we're doing now or a central a centrist ground yeah and and of course the 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 other side of that equation is that there are arguments now that that the political the tempo of politics is mismatched to the tempo of society and so that it moves too slowly so that you know these 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 political points of decision like brexit you know, it, and, and, you, and you have this thing and it, 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 it's like collapsing a waveform in physics. You know, suddenly it, it's there and you have to live with it as opposed to some system where there's a constant remeasuring, which is, you know, sounds like science fiction now, although it's technologically possible. And, and the idea of that is that society is, and technology and the techno-social reality is moving so fast that, that our 19th and 18th century systems, which you know, posited where you elect a, a, a government or, you, or you, you decide on policies and you leave them there for a while it is actually mismatched. So could you to, go to a kind of semi-referendum-based system, again, we're just now theorizing, based on some sort of accountability system, and I want to come into this later, using, let's say, blockchain technology where you get to vote on all various issues and you poll it, is that a way of doing it? Switzerland does that by having its right. many referendums yeah. certain things. I don't know if that's the right answer because referendums are somewhat dangerous in their own path, but it works for Switzerland. 
we don't, there's, there's not much extremism in Switzerland. No. The country has a path and the way it goes and the way it does things, and it kind of works. So I think maybe. you would have to really understand how well educated the Swiss are, to, because I think if, when, when, when historians look back, one of the great failures, I think, they're, at least in terms of the United States, is going to be our failure of education, because we expect people to vote and make decisions, either even if it's indirect, you're voting for, for you know, politicians in whom you're putting a trust, political trust to make decisions on your behalf, but you're expected to vote on a, a range of very complex issues, more complex than ever, and our education system has failed to the extent that people don't actually understand what they're voting for, not because they're not intelligent, but because they're not sufficiently educated. Yeah, but the other, the, but what, the pushback you get from suggestions like that is, oh, well, that's an elitist world that you're looking at. And that's complex, um, and you're right, you know, from the ground up, people need to be to have a better understanding of these things. But then it does become the intellectual elites against the others, and does that actually take into account their voice? I'm not sure that it does either. So it's, I get the point, but I worry that it also misses the point. I, I agree with you. I mean, you're almost blocked at every, you know, every-, every That's right, thing, there, there, there are no easy answers We, we don't see the answer at this point. It's, it's the horizon problem, it's over the horizon. Yeah, and, and this is where I'm, super excited and super worried about where things are going, and that's the rise of behavioral economics. Um, and the reason being is, let's say we go into a world where, well, it's happening now. In fact, politics has become behavioral. So behavioral economics came out of a guy called Skinner, and Skinner basically tested lab, um, rats in a lab and gave them stimulus, positive and negative stimulus. Um, and th as soon as the rats learned it, they learned that they could get the stimulus, whether it was water or whether it's to avoid an electric shock, which was the other, the negative and positives, and avoidance of pain. So they would, they would hit a lever and the electric force field in this cage would stop. That whole thing was about how your environment conditions you. And it was a big breakthrough. Out of that became behavioral economics and Thales just won the Nobel Prize for behavioral economics. But the advertising industry was first to catch on. They realize you can create incentives for people, false or, or real, to, to act in certain ways. But now technology has allowed us to do this at scale. And the last US election, the Brexit vote, and a number of other things were really the grand experiments of behavioral economics. Um, and now the problem is with this, in a technology-driven world, it's incredibly easy to influence people without them knowing. Yeah. Just look at your Amazon feed, your Facebook feed, and all of these. Incredibly, and I don't think anybody understands this, behavioral economics has basically won the world and nobody realizes it. Back in um, the mid-2000s, Jeff Bezos, the two um, founders of Google, Mark Zuckerberg, and a bunch of others, and I can't remember who else was there, all had a meeting with Kahneman, who's one of the founders of, of modern behavioral economics. And he explained to them that basically the dopamine sensors and how people are conditioned by environments and not necessarily by reasoning or other things. And how Facebook could use the like button and emoticons to drive dopamine releases in humans, which they want more. It's the lab experiment for the rat in the water. It's exactly the same thing. Amazon picked it up, they all picked it up and they used it to extremes. But then what they found is, firstly, they could get people to buy things and engage in the platform because anger, like, all of these things create dopamine receptors and stuff like that, and adrenaline, and things that we get slightly addicted to as humans. But then after that, they realized that they could sell that ability to anybody, firstly to advertisers, and then to anybody else could abuse it. Now we have this open system that, that these things, and they can be abused. Now, whatever extent the Russians influence the election, I'm less interested in that, but anybody can influence anybody. That's right. So now governments can influence anybody in the same way by using behavioral incentives because they have massive data abilities. If you think, go back to the artificial intelligence and the speed of processing, all that stuff, now who stands a chance in any of this? Do we even have what we think of freedom of choice anymore? I don't know. Behavioral economics could be really interesting as ways of creating incentive systems. So they've used it, they're using it in India right now to stop people getting run over on uh, train tracks. You know, and they use these nudges. Yeah. And nudges that, you know, the UK government has used them, the US government did for a little bit, but haven't for a while. But many governments have started to do this. 
And there's a huge debate about nudges. Uh, That's right. Several. That's right. And there's, so there should be. Some of it can be very useful in, in creating incentive-based systems that work. China, on the other hand, has taken a huge behavioral economic experiment based on punishment systems, which don't work as well as reward systems. But their punishment systems, they're, they're kind of good society credits or, mm-hmm. or penalties that you get for doing certain things that aren't right. And that's behavioral economics to run a population, which is really getting more concerning. So I think there's many things we can fix using behavioral economics and incentive, you know, how to get people to pay taxes, how to do this, how to incentivize people into the economy, how to pe- get people to set up business, become entrepreneurs, how to get education in better ways, all sorts of things. If you understand behavioral economics, you can change into an education system. Problem is, there's the world of governments and what they can do with it if you've got the wrong government. And worse than that is the bad actors in this open architecture of technology, the information superhighway, what the hell they can do. Yeah. And that, you know, then you say, who was smart? Were the Russians, the Iranians, and the Chinese smart to close their internet? Maybe they are. Well, this is the splintering effect that I think you see. It's, it's part of the same. You know, yes, it's overall, all part of the same thing. It's all about the same thing. But you know, one of the things that I, I find so fascinating about behavioral economics is the extent to which it has blown away, essentially, the classical economic assumption, neoclassical economic assumption, that that essentially people are rational actors who, who take actions designed to you know, uh, maximize their benefit. And that's, that's just not actually true. It's scientifically proven. That's the difference here with behavioral economics. It's scientifically proven that people yeah. base most of their actions not on, I mean, the behaviorists will argue there is no nature and nurture debate. Everything is nurture. That yeah. there is very little instinct within the human being. Um, and there's very little proven instinct. And that's a very complicated argument, I won't go into, but basically everything is an effect of our environment. So therefore, all economic theory is essentially worthless. But there's also the, the element of behavioral economics that goes back to early human experience, you know, the, 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 the early humanoids, the hominids and, and, our, and our immediate predecessors who evolved over in, in small groups in hunter-gatherer societies where it was always safer to think that there was a lion in the grass. And th- th- this has created a whole series of, of bi- what they call cognitive biases. Exactly. And those biases are incredibly interesting. And I think if you, if you learn to see them in yourself, you can, you can at least try to recognize when you're making some of these mistakes. And those mistakes often, I think, contribute to failures in markets and, and just failures well, and look, lives. if we go back to the big examples that we talked about of the rise of debt and the rise of the pension plan, both were basically reward-based systems. Mm-hmm. They were basically, you don't need to spend as much money, give this guy here, you get instant gratification consumption. Exactly, yeah. Right, so what, as humans, we're almost conditioned to do that. Yeah. Because we're the lab, uh, we're the, the, the rat in the lab who'll go for the water every time because it feels yeah. good. What chance have we stand? And that was the failure of government and regulation, I think. Many people at first would have said, you can't regulate this. We all need the ability to do this. In the end, we created a rotten pile of mess because it wouldn't be regulated. And then we have the other problem of the, the influence of global corporations within government. Yeah. Well, what you're, what you're actually describing is several different kinds of social engineering experiments going on yes. at the same time. Yes. All of which are using one form or another of behavioral economics. That's right. But to, to accomplish different things. Exactly. And, um, and I think that that's where we are right now. Now, but government overall has not used it yet for the good. You know, how do you nudge society in certain ways? How do you create, and maybe, and we'll come on to a bit of this, how do you create a, um, let's say, a moral code in this tribalized world, a tribalized world where technology is tribalizing everybody, <clears throat> can that be done by incentive-based systems? When you talked in the world on the brink about what is the future kind of system, I see a role for this, because there are ways of not having the government that we know it now, but having you know, a more, it's in the world where we have a more kind of disintermediated government, yeah. where then they don't have the overarching rule, but they're involved at micro level in, in a number of things. Maybe that's the way you can deal with it, because you can't have an, overriding skill set when half your population live in a country but don't live in the country. Right, yeah. You know, if you live on the yeah. internet, you live in a different world. That's right, yeah. I mean, you, you have, you know, of course, this kind of idea 
is, is the fodder of, of conspiracy theories and all those sorts of things, which I find to be a, a fascinating topic because, and I think they go to some of the cognitive biases that we have. Yeah. People would rather believe that, there, that someone is, is in control of things, even if it's someone working against their interests, then they would like to believe that there's simply no one in control and people are managing from the edges and the thing is just reeling. And, and I, that you know, is, is in fact, the way I look at it. I don't think any. I think people try to exercise control. I don't think there is a great master plan. I think no. people are humans. They try their best, do what no. they want. Now, whether they have good intent, ill intent, or, or a balance between the two. Yeah, I mean, I, I just don't see it. But then the problem is, is then there is always the hand grenade when there was a conspiracy theory. Right. Like, I was shocked to the core when I first read The Confessions of an Economic Hitman, which was about a guy who worked for, I think it was the World Bank or the IMF, and what he did on behalf of the US to destroy governments. I'm like, Jeez, oh, yeah. I don't want to believe in this world. Yeah. But then if you believe in that, you can almost believe in anything. So that makes well, it very easy for people to believe in any conspiracy that it, there is some big lever being pulled. This, another, another way to approach it is that all conspiracy theories are, are correct and that there's someone trying to do that conspiracy, but that none of them have that much effect in the, in the bigger picture. Yeah. So, I mean, this could be a whole program. We won't go, That's right. Go into that. I mean, it's a fascinating topic. But I think that, that to explore the behavioral economics a bit more, you know, they talk about these two systems. System one, which is fast thinking, it's, 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 it's re relatively automatic. It's this idea of heuristics, which means rules of thumb, things that you, know, that you just use to make snap decisions. And then there's the system two, which is analytical, slow thinking, considered. And, and system one, system two is what we prize as, as the human you know, ability to, but system one often defeats system two yeah. on a daily basis, yeah. almost an hourly, minute to minute basis. We think we're individuals. But if we shouted fire in this studio, nine times out of 10, almost everybody did the same thing. That's right. That's right, yeah. And you know, so we're not, we, we actually operate in certain ways that are predictable, and the more data you have, the more you understand how it works. That's right. That you don't need to use forecast models, you can actually just analyze the data and the trends from that. Yeah. Which throws again, going back to, it throws out all of the old economic models because they weren't based on data analysis. Yeah, that's Data right. analysis will now rules the world Absolutely. as these high frequency trading firms and the algorithm trading firms and the artificial yeah. intelligence players are all proving. Yeah, you know, one of the interesting topics in that, of course, confirmation bias is one of the most deadly of the, <laughs> yeah. of the behavioral economic biases that, you know, we, we, we look to find information that confirms what we already believe yeah. instead of finding information that could falsify it, which is what scientific method is based on, is that you Correct. try to falsify, you don't try to verify. You know, the, the whole American adventure in Iraq based on the, the intelligence finding that there were weapons of mass destruction it, which was, you know, in large part based on ignoring evidence that there weren't. It was, it was simply selective use of intelligence, which is, which is confirmation bias. It, it can be incredibly problematic, but it's yeah. something that, that is so, you know, there's some kind of a, of a switch that flips and you decide, oh, it's an aha moment. I see it. I got it. I understand it now. Let me find all these things that, that, that tell me I'm right. Because humans are so delusional. I mean, I, I fall into that bias all the time, as everybody does. And this is why the machine is so powerful and why we have to be actually truly concerned, not flippantly concerned, but truly concerned because there is no bias. And it's the massive ability to process data in ways that the human brain can't. We can process incredible data, like everything we're seeing now and all the colors and all. Machines are nowhere near that, nowhere near our cognitive abilities in certain ways. We cannot process a fixed amount of, a fixed type of data in the quantity that these machines can without a bias. Because yeah. we need patterns to fill in the blanks. Yeah. And it's our pattern recognition that causes our problems. It is, it is our pattern. It, it's both our, it's, it's a double-edged sword. Exactly. It's a classic double-edged sword. Yeah. There is, you know, an, an emerging narrative um, that is claiming that computer programs do have biases, and the biases are based on the people who write the programs. And there's been some interesting work on this, <laughs> that, you know, that, that you think it's unbiased, but when you actually reverse engineer well, so that's, it. That's an interesting point. So therefore, are, is AI a function of its environment too, like a human is? Exactly. So behavioral economics applies to machines in the end too. In some way, that we don't understand. Although the interesting one was the, uh, was the deep mind experiment with, with 
Go and chess and all of these things. And, you know, th this machine got so fast at beating every grandmaster and every computer that ever existed in all of these games. But what happened was, what really blew people away, it was developing moves that nobody had ever used before. Right. Because humans hadn't moved. So I don't know where that came from because it was learning, one machine was learning from another. So I don't know whether those biases carry through necessarily because there's been clear evidence in that particular experiment that they learned their own way, which hadn't been used before. They did, and they're, they're, that, that is very interesting. Um, and the, the, you know, the, and this is yet another topic we don't have time to go into, <laughs> but the, 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 one of the most fascinating things about the, the argument about artificial intelligence is you know, computers are great at calculation, and they're great at things like Go and chess that require calculation. They are, they are not great at things that even animals can do that, that requires something that is, seems to be beyond calculation. It's, there's a lot of debate about what that is now and, and whether computers will ever get to That's it right. and, and whether computers will ever get conscious. You know, there's this thing called Mary's Room and the Mary's Room is a thought experiment and I, I can't recall the name of the philosopher who came up with it, but Mary is a very bright girl who has learned everything possible about color. She's learned everything about how the eye receives color and the cones and, the, and she's learned all the things about the electromagnetism of color and of the color red particularly and she's learned everything that you, know, that you can learn from reading about the color red. And, but she has done it her entire life in a gray room on a gray screen and she's never seen any color except for gray. So the question is when the door finally opens and she walks out and she sees a red apple, does she have new information? Is, is, is the actual visceral experience of that something that, that can't be accounted for in her vast knowledge of the color red? And that's one of the thought experiments they used to say, will computers ever have consciousness? Hmm. Will they ever actually be able to, to do the things that humans can do so easily? Like looking around a room and saying, well, those, those are chairs and that's a, you know, that's a box, but I can turn it over and use it as a chair. All these things that we can just we can just do without thinking about it, and many, many more. And so it's, you know, it, it, I agree with you, we need to be very worried about it, but it's, it's still up in the air whether, whether artificial intelligence is really intelligence or whether it's really consciousness and where the divide comes between what makes us human is it, or, or even what makes biological intelligence different from silicon-based intelligence. Yeah, and then he who controls the machines in that world rules the world. Yeah. Um, and again, it goes back to, you know, wh whoever has the capital to run these things essentially can run the world. Well, and this is going to become, I think, one of the, one of the biggest issues is that as, as um, you know, and, and it, again, it's where you, you know, there are going to be political uh, solutions that are going to have to emerge because you simply are not going to have, it's not going to be feasible. It's going to be a negative externality, if you want to put it that way, to the people who own these things, that they simply are, there's going to be too many people who are simply not going to, to be satisfied for, for them to have all the... But the thing is, is, you know, Silicon Valley thinks it has an answer in the universal basic wage, but I don't, I've never seen that, which is a inverse incentive system, yeah. actually creating happiness amongst humans because they have no sense of purpose and they're not incentivized to be productive, maybe they don't need to be productive. How do they then live productive lives that gives us a sense of being? Yeah, that's meaningful very, lives. Meaningful lives, yeah. that's very complicated, and that requires a whole new set of government. You know, maybe, you know, if you look at what the experiment Bhutan did and the universal happiness, you know, maybe that is something that's within it, and that's maybe what the government's role is to do in the end, and not just endlessly drive GDP for no purpose, but you need to have a happy population. You know, the, the question of what is government, what is its purpose, is, is nothing that's really ever addressed. No, that, that's true. And, and well, it's, you know, we've had lots of theories about it. And, and the, I think you know, another interesting thing about the present moment is that all of the systems that we've had are seen to not be working. And you yeah. know, so again, we're, we, we're at this point where you know, I like the term a horizon problem, meaning that you can't see what's over the horizon. But, By definition. But what's odd is that horizon is hurtling towards us. Exactly, exactly. That's exactly you know, right. I, I think the world has become, is becoming almost ungovernable in the way that we understand it because, and I produced a piece from Real Vision that, um, for the Macro Insiders guys that most people haven't seen, but, but I think we'll put it together with this to go out because 
I talked about the, the tribalism stuff that you and I have talked so, so much about. Um, and, you know, wh what world can you construct a societal moral code or ethics code or a group of society norms when we physically are located in this society, we're right now in the United States, but we can do anything online. We can be anybody. We can have whatever ethics code we want. And we are basically not restricted by any government in what we do. So we have the code that we have in this country, but that now is an increasingly small part of our lives because yeah. increasingly more and more of our lives are lived in the global sphere of the internet. And I don't know how government can even operate in that system. How do you, how do you even get people to do things? Which is why I think behavioral economics is part of it. And also somehow the problems of the tribalism is this, is that it, it breaks rifts everywhere you yeah. go. We've just seen the story broken about the Russians and the vaccine yeah. story. You know, that they've gone online looking for a contentious issues vaccine and then have given the pro and the against arguments, created big fights and splintered people. Yeah. Again, using basically behavioral economics principles on what drives people's emotive behavior and created a rift yeah. where none existed. Right. And the online tribalism creates rifts everywhere. Well, of course, you know, Russia is an interesting example because Russia, what Russia really is afraid of is the United States undermining and overthrowing the Russian government. And so their policy, if you step back and look at it, is, is not about putting one group forward politically as much as it's about simply creating discord and chaos. Absolutely. That's because, what they want. Because the do. more domestically focused the U.S. is on its own domestic policy and the and the uh, the discontent within its people, yeah. the less they operate in the world stage, the freer Russia is to operate in its own way, yeah. and the less they're under pressure for regime change or any other change. And of course, you do have to say that the United States has, over the last 20 years, attempted and, and accomplished, in some cases, many examples of regime change. Yeah. So it is not an insane idea. That, no, and you know, of course the US is doing the same. I'm just not sure they they're yeah. as prevalent <laughs> online as the Russians and the Chinese and the Iranians and the Israelis have been, have been masterful at this because they realize that I can't fight you with a nuclear warhead. There's no way I can fight you with a gun or any other weapon. But guess what? You don't regulate your internet. So I can walk in and do anything I want and it's completely open architecture for me. I can get anything out of Facebook, which has been proven. The worst thing is people are bang on about this is Google is the largest um, the largest um, receptacle of information on humans that exists on Earth. Yep. It is owned by private hands. Not one of us knows the security measures, how the data is secure, what hacks happen on a daily basis to Google. What are the state players doing in cyber wars with Google? Who's protecting it? Is the US state helping it not lose this? Should it be in, in, in private hands? I know the libertarians amongst people would say, you know, it should be that the state has too much power here. I'm sorry, but this is a company that has a finite number of resources. It's not even worth a trillion dollars, and it needs to fight the entire Chinese cyber program. So they don't steal our program, because if they steal our data, using behavioral economics, they can, they can adjust how we do things and what we do, and the malcontent or happiness, everything. About well, and of course, they've stolen data left and right. I mean, how did the Chinese get a an aircraft carrier, one of the most complicated machines ever ex up and running in, in, in record short time. Yeah. They stole the American manuals on how to run an aircraft carrier, essentially. That, yeah. That's what they did. Yeah. And, and that is just one example. Yeah, not, IP know, rights and all of this. And absolutely. the US are bad players in the same, everybody's a bad player in this world. So right. the conspiracy theorists are right. But, um, you know, the, the, of course, the, the answer to your question of, it, 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 you know, how do you, how do you deal with this is, is again this splintering effect, and you know Scott Malcolmson has come up with this term splinter net, which he thinks, and he's being proven prescient about it, is, is that the, the world is is splintering, the internet is splintering, and you know, so the Russians and the Chinese can reach a point where the United States has to d change it, the configuration of its internet. And then you see they, it's, it's a win, you know, a win win situation. They win if they, if they, from their standpoint, if they create chaos in the US, they also win if they turn us into a less free society. So, you know, it's, it's, yes, head, head and you win, the problem is, is a lot of the answers are 
um, more government control. But I've got an idea that's been developing my head about this, is how do you do this? And Tim Berners-Lee's been looking at this, the invention of the internet, in how we can deal with this. And one of my things is, firstly, we need to be responsible online. The anonymity of the internet is a big problem that creates tribalism. Because I may, on, on, um, online, call you anything I want, but the chance of me doing that to your face right. are very slim. Maybe yeah. after a few drinks, I might, but you know. <laughs> <laughs> but, um, but you know what I mean? That kind of human element is disconnected by the internet. Now, if you had some form of identity online, and let's call it a blockchain style identity. Right, yeah. So everything you do in your footprint online is traceable to you. So therefore, your trolling online, your abuse, your what you do, it would have to be somehow, well, it's decentralized. So it's very difficult to hack. That's it's right. very difficult to, to do anything with. Maybe there's an answer with that that allows you to do that. And then you know, voting can come the same way. And a number of things can be built off an architecture that means you have to take responsibility for who you are. Because then if you're a Russian bot, I can see from this that you're not part of that system. So then you can have a decentralized internet, but without centralized control. Yeah because it gets controlled in itself because you can't have an identifier without being somebody. And if you're just some jerk in high school who's uh, you know, harassing some other student to the point that they might commit suicide, you can also see who you are. So exactly, it, it, now, yeah. and does that have to be handed over to government? Because you know, the Bitcoin world has been not too bad at policing itself when there's theft and stuff like that, <clears throat> because you can see where things move and who does what. So maybe yeah. it doesn't require what people would think, oh my God, the government's going to take all of our data. Maybe the data can be decentralized and the government doesn't need to do it, but the government can adjust our behavior patterns by our incentive programs to create a unified approach to society and a globalized internet society. I think the, the issue is that to make it ubiquitous, there has to be something that, that does that. In other words, somebody has to ensure that every single person or exactly. every avatar, every you know, fake person, whatever, they, they all have this blockchain identity, ID. Yeah, and whether tag. it's blockchain or whether it's something else. But whatever some it is, but, but there's, there's something that has to, you know, it's not going to simply happen on its own. And so how do you affect that? How well, maybe you can't have it unless you apply for it in person. So I, well, it comes yeah. with your birthright. Right. It's your identifier. Call it your passport yeah, number. Yeah, your, your call passport, it, your social call security it, number. Yeah, and call it in India your ADAR number. Okay, there's, I know people don't, some people don't like the ADAR thing because it's a centralized database, but just say it's your fingerprint, it's your retina scan, it is you, your digital footprint. Right, yeah. And let's say it's not held by government. That appease all of the people who are scared of governments having control over this, and true, they, it's kept, it's... It's not right, but so that decentralized thing could be somewhere the answer. Yeah. And again, I think somewhere the answer is some sort of behavioral economic element to get people to have an incentive-based system to behave in a societal way, whatever right. that is. Yeah. So you know, in the midst of all these things that we've been talking about of splintering and, and social decohesion and all these issues, we're seeing the rise of a kind of a figure globally, the strongman type leader. Yeah. that we have not seen except here and there, but it's, it's now a global phenomenon. Correct. What do you think is behind that? I think when fear of change becomes extreme, usually you find a strong man. So if you look at the strong man that came in the Middle East, and again, a lot of this was in the world on a brink, it came after periods of huge change. Strong man is, you'll save us. We don't know what's going on, but you'll help us. Now, obviously, the strongman usually alienates a mellow pop because it usually comes hand in hand with populism. It's very rare. Sometimes you get the centrist, the Gandhi style, which brings everybody together, but often you get the polarized version, which is what we're getting now, which is we're rejecting that, so this is something to stand behind. So I think it, it comes out of all of these seeds of, of discontent. It comes out of this fear of change. You talk about it, the, the, uh, the, the desire for nostalgia, Please take us back to something we understand. And, you know, it's difficult to express to people because people take a snapshot of now, they don't realize, you know, 2010, Facebook was just taking off. Yeah. And now it's ruling governments, our buying, our spending patterns, our news patterns, the information, the false information, everything we know is being by run by these platforms that didn't exist a decade ago or existed in a really nascent way. Yeah. That's how fast things are changing. 
we cannot catch up. We're fighting a warfare with nuclear warheads when in fact the warfare is being held over Facebook. I mean, this is how fast things are moving. And that's only one of the things, you know, artificial intelligence, robotics, um, all of this stuff, everything is coming. It's, and I think big data was the kind of big revolution that was the enabler for the whole lot. So that is why I think is people just holding on to somebody who'll tell them a message that they can believe in. Because they, they simply can't deal with being out in the, adrift in the ocean of change and they, they, they don't recognize the world that, they've, that they find themselves in. Well, because and, most people, and I talk about this a lot in business, personal lives, everything, most people fear change. I'm the kind of guy who actually likes change. Yeah, so do I. Most, <laughs> but most people fear change. Yeah. They, they, they like things, just be as they are. If you can, just yeah. that, that, that's fine. You know, I want to be at home, I want to have my barbecue on Saturday, I want to have the kids, I want to have the dog, and uh, you know, that's how my life is. Nothing wrong with that. But so when, when change is happening fast and somebody says, I will stop this, I will, I will, be, I will hold back the sea, yeah. then they go, okay, please, just do that. Yeah, I, think, I think there's also this fear of cognitive dissonance or this need for cognitive dissonance to be resolved where you, know, you, you think you understand things and then things are going in entire. It's, it's very closely related, but it's a little bit distinct is that you know, you, you, you've got two things or more than two things that are at, at loggerheads or in opposition you know, in terms of the, the concepts yeah. that you're having to hold in your head at one time. And it seems that that's, that's something that's extremely corrosive or, or, or difficult or just um, unpleasant for a lot of people. I, personally, I believe, I try to have cognitive dissonance because if I don't have it, then I think I'm, I'm convincing myself that I understand something that I maybe don't understand. Yeah, I'm, And I think it's a useful trait, but a, 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 I think it's also, it is, and it is, it is disturbing, but you, you, know, you have to, if, if you're gonna use it as a tool, you have to get used to being disturbed. That's by. right, the future is uncertain. Arguably, it's more uncertain than it has been for a very long period of time because of all these changes we're talking about. Not necessarily the politics, I'm just talking about the technology and where is this path going to lead to? How are all of these things going to fit together? That's very hard for most people to deal with who like to go to work every day, get paid, go for dinner on the weekend. You know, do, you know that thing <coughs> is very much under threat, Yeah, obviously. So I'm going to, to end, ask you a very unfair question. <laughs> Two unfair questions. Okay. What do you think the biggest surprise we're going to have in the next 12 months and, in, and secondly, in the next five years might be? I'm not going to hold you to it, but I'd just love to have your thoughts. So I'm going to talk against my own biases. Maybe the biggest surprise is that this whole process of what many of us think is the big change, the fourth turning, the fracturing of the global economic system, the system that creates the new system within. Maybe it doesn't happen in the next 10 years. Maybe it drags on longer. Maybe we're in a lot longer phase, the phase that Argentina's been in for 50 years. I don't know. But there's a hope amongst us all as optimists, even though we're pessimistic, we're still kind of optimistic that something better will come out of it. And maybe it doesn't. Maybe that process is much longer because we're talking human terms and not in our instant gratification terms of the next recession, it'll all blow up, it'll all happen, it'll all clean, we'll all clean the slate. The new leader will arise who's a centrist, who will take us through with this enlightened journey of understanding the world that we live in. Maybe that doesn't happen. Maybe we flip between left and right. Strong men, a general loss of freedoms, so all of these things that have been the feature, maybe that continues. Maybe each time there's a blow up in certain areas, it gets papered over yet again and again, and this thing goes on and on and on. So that would be my longer term thing, which is against my own view, but just I just like to question the short term. I, mean, I, I like to question my own views. And to that, I would say, I would say most people, I think we are, at a 50-50 outcome of the US, of the, almost the entire administration going to prison, or the entire administration getting voted in twice on a landslide victory. I think those are the two outcomes. Um, 
because if we do not reach resolution, things only get worse. It'll strengthen that story because if I look at the story of the centrists or the oppositions or anybody else, there is no cohesive story except to attack. If you're attacking, you're not listening to the people who are doing that. And so I think that that's not a way to win anything. The other thing is, I think there's a reasonable probability without you know, trying to put my own bias into this, that there's an extraordinary amount of criminality that went on, whether that was with the Russians or without the Russians. So I think there is a reasonably high probability if I look at how Mueller is pursuing this like a mob prosecution and going up the chain and basically discrediting everybody within the chain, I think he's not put a foot wrong. And so I feel that that is a reasonable chance. So there's a 50-50 chance of Right. Half the administration going to prison, I mean, literally half the people involved in the administration going to prison, or they get a landslide victory in an election in the last eight years. I wouldn't argue about, with you about that, and I wouldn't argue with you about your longer term prediction. And I think that one of the, one of the again, the biases that we have is that it, it's either dystopia and it's a, you know, an apocalyptic scenario, and it's a nuclear war, zombie apocalypse, whatever it is, or it's utopia and it's, you know, that would, and, and we may just muddle through. And maybe that's the best. You know, well, it depends, possible. it depends whether muddling through, because I, I think you'll agree that the muddling through is creating more extreme outcomes right now. That's true. In the political environment and maybe the personal welfare of people and a number of things. So, <clears throat> If that's the case, if the muddle through is I, we don't have a slate cleaning opportunity with a new way for a new world, you know, I think the extremes get further. And I, that's not a great world to live in. Yeah. But that was the world of the 1970s. You know, we talk about the 70s has a halo effect for people. Mm -hmm. I grew up in the 70s, I could play in the streets and I could ride my bicycle and you know, all of that stuff. Mm -hmm. But the reality was it was a bloody awful world of a huge geopolitical mess. Um, huge economic mess, which was an economic hangover for the, almost the entire decade. Maybe that can go for another decade or so. I guess, I hope we see it. I hope we see what happens. Yeah, well, exactly. I think seeing what happens is the most interesting thing here, because we don't know, neither of us know. No. We're just trying to observe. And again, neither of us are coming with any particular bias in this. We're just saying, listen, this is a fascinating set of circumstances, which is probably, I think, the most one of the most exciting points in all history is the point we're now in and where we go. I agree with you. And you know the old Chinese curse, may you live in interesting times. <laughs> and I'm not sure it's a curse. I think it's fascinating too. Raul, always a pleasure. Dee, it loved it. Thanks so much. Thank you. It was great to interview Raul on so many topics that relate to our changing world today. We really covered the waterfront and I hope you enjoyed as much as I did Raul's thoughts and ideas on the nature of the changes we're seeing where markets might be going, and where we as a world are going today. Thank you for watching.